So we're here today in Daniel chapter 9. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. The ushers will give you a Bible, and it's page 879 in the church Bibles, Daniel chapter 9. A quick little intro before I read from chapter 9. If you were with us last week, you will remember that I said that Daniel chapters 1 through 6 are basically an historical narrative of the 65 years that Daniel spent serving the various kings of Babylonia and Persia. And then chapters 7 through 12 are more of a prophetic journal that records future events that God showed Daniel through different dreams and visions that he records. And so as he wrote down these dreams and visions, he attached it as like an addendum to the first six chapters. Therefore, chapter 7 through 12 are not really in chronological order. These are various dreams and visions God gave Daniel that he wrote down at different times of his life and that get attached here at the end of the book of Daniel. So the first half of Daniel is like an historical narrative. The last half of Daniel, much like a prophetic journal. And last week, we looked at a really super uplifting topic from chapter 7 and 8, the coming of the Antichrist. I know that you were really excited about that topic, and today you're hoping it'll be better than that, and I'm sure it will be. How can you not improve on the topic of the Antichrist? And so uh, it's going to be better than that. It's going to be more encouraging than that today. We, We could even talk about presidential politics, and it would be more encouraging than the topic of the Antichrist. Then again, it might be pretty similar. But anyway, let's take a look here at Daniel chapter 9. Let me pray first. Lord, thank you for this time in your word and for this opportunity we have to gather in your name. We just thank you, Jesus, for your grace and your love and for your mercy. And we pray as we look into these topics today through Daniel 9 that you will just speak to our hearts today. How good it is to be in your house. Your word says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's good to be here in your presence today, Lord, to worship you and to give thanks together. And we do pray for our local elections coming up, that you'll just move in our hearts to make wise decisions, that we would not remain passive, but we would make our values known, that we would not be silent, but we would lift up our voices in a way that would honor you and glorify you in all things. We thank you for this time now in your word. We pray you would bless it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. In Daniel chapter 9, if you look at the first two verses with me, Daniel says that in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, underline that, that he would accomplish, that is God would accomplish 70 years in the, desolation, in the desolations of Jerusalem. Okay, let's pause there. Let me just tell you what is happening here. It's the first year of the reign of King Darius, so that kind of gives us a benchmark. Uh, Daniel is now in his Uh, early 80s, and he is uh, having his morning devos one day, and he's sitting down in an easy chair with a cup of coffee from Babylon Bucks, and uh, he's he's reading his Bible, and the Bible tells us here in verse 2 that he's reading through the prophet Jeremiah. So, same book of Jeremiah that we have in our Old Testaments. Daniel is reading. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet during the days of Daniel when Daniel was a young boy living in Jerusalem. And uh, Jeremiah had warned the Jewish people that if they did not turn from their sin and their idolatry and turn towards God, that what God was going to do as a way of getting their attention and disciplining them was he was going to call for King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to come to besiege Jerusalem and to take captive the Jewish people back to Babylon where they would sit for 70 years on kind of a big time out until they learned how they had offended God and sinned against him so that they would be purged from idolatry. Jeremiah is that prophet during the days when Daniel was a young boy in Jerusalem. And this is what Daniel heard. Daniel heard Jeremiah warning the people about God's impending uh, judgment that would come upon them. But unfortunately, the people did not heed the word of Jeremiah. They disobeyed. They did not repent. God whistled for Nebuchadnezzar. He came. He besieged Jerusalem in 586 B.C. He took thousands of Jews as captives, as basically prisoners of war, back to Babylon. And Daniel, as a young teenager, was swept up among these captives and taken to Babylon. 
And there he is at about the age of 15. The Bible says he was hand selected among a few to be trained in the ways of Babylon, the literature of Babylon, the language of Babylon, that he might serve in the king's court, which is what happened. Daniel, this young Jewish boy taken as a prisoner of war, ends up serving the kings of Babylonia and Persia over a period of 65 years, always remaining faithful and true to the Lord his God, even though he had been removed from everything that was familiar and comfortable. His country, his language, uh, his family, uh, his culture, uh, and not that he was separated from his faith, but he was certainly separated from where his faith was practiced, which was Jerusalem, the temple being destroyed. And so he finds himself over here now in Babylon, and by the time we get here to chapter 9, he's had a very uh, rich uh, career uh, serving these various kings of Babylonia and Persia, being faithful to the Lord the whole time, and now here in chapter 9, he's in his early 80s. And he sits down and he starts reading from the book of Jeremiah about how God will bring his people back to Jerusalem after 70 years are complete. God had predetermined 70 years. And so Jeremiah had mentioned this. And as Daniel is reading Jeremiah, Daniel starts doing the math. And he realizes, I was 15, thereabouts, when I was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar and taken off to Babylon. And I'm now approaching 85 years of age. So do the math, right? He knows the 70 years are about up. And he begins to recognize that soon the Jewish people will be allowed to go back to Jerusalem. He doesn't quite know how. He doesn't realize that God's going to also raise up Cyrus, or, or maybe he does know, but that's what God will soon do. The a king who will be favorably disposed to the Jewish people, and Cyrus will allow the Jews to go back. But Daniel is sitting here reading his own Jewish scriptures. He's reading the scroll of Jeremiah, and he's realizing 70 years are about up. The people are going to get to go back. Now, he never will himself. There's no record of his death, but it is presumed that he dies and is buried in Babylon, and he never goes back home. I mean, he's, he's in his upper 80s now. It's a 900,000-mile journey, not the easiest thing for anybody, let alone somebody in your 80s. And as he begins to contemplate all this, he is touched by the character and nature of God. Now, we know the portion of Scripture he was reading in the book of Jeremiah because there's only one passage where Jeremiah is specific about 70 years being the total of their captivity, and then God will bring them back. And so we know exactly where Daniel was reading. And in our Bibles, it's from chapter 29. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to put the verses on the screen for you. It's Jeremiah 29, verses 10 to 14. Here's what Daniel was reading. And, and, and note how God is presented here in these verses. Verse 10, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you and cause you to return to this place, to Jerusalem. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Verse 13, and you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. This is what Daniel's reading. And let me tell you what happens as Daniel's reading this. He becomes broken before God. He's reading here through the scroll of Jeremiah about God's faithfulness and his mercy and his, and his, his intentions for the people, that he has them in his heart and in his mind. He has a future and a hope for them, and he wishes them peace, not evil. And he says, if you pray to me, I'll listen to you. And if you search for me, you will find me. And Daniel's reading this, and he's cut to the heart. He's cut to the heart. And he starts fasting and praying and confessing, he starts confessing his sin and the sins of the people of Israel, the Jewish people. Now, it's not that Daniel was a bad man, but he's not a perfect man. Nobody's perfect except Jesus. And so Daniel's even gripped with his own sin. And so he starts praying and fasting and confessing sin. Look at verses 3 and 4. He says, Then I set my face 
This is back here in Daniel 9, verse 3. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. Now, by the way, your attention, this is typical fashion for a Jewish person in, in ancient times in a season of grieving or mourning. They would fast, they would go without food, they would put on sackcloth, and they would sprinkle ashes on themselves. Now, sackcloth was basically a garment made out of really itchy material, something like goat's, goat's hair or, or uh, wool. Um, you know, very itchy, very uncomfortable. Uh, think of like, like a, just going around wearing a very itchy burlap bag as your, as your outfit, as your clothing. And the reason they did this was because they wanted their clothing to mimic the agony of their soul. They wanted to re remind themselves and experience the, the discomfort of, from the friction of this uncomfortable clothing to just kind of remind them and to just kind of illustrate the, the friction and the agony of their soul. So they would put on sackcloth and then they would also sprinkle their faces and their head with ashes. It was just a sign of grieving. It was just a sign like I'm in the dust. I'm, I'm you know, feeling uh, uh, very sad and, um, and I'm, in, I'm in mourning. And so this was typical fashion, fasting, sackcloth and ashes. Now, remember in the New Testament, Jesus actually chastised the Pharisees when they would do this kind of thing. But the difference was that the Pharisees did it for show. They did it because they wanted people to see how spiritual and holy they were. Their hearts were not into it. Jesus knew it, so he called them out on it. Daniel's doing it for a very different reason. Daniel here is very grievous over his sins and over the sins of his people. And so he's doing this as an outward expression of what's going on in his heart. He's broken and he's grieving over, over sin. And, and he expresses it. I'm just going to read a few verses. If you're still there in Daniel 9, I'll read verses 5 through 11 so you can kind of see just what he's, what he's repenting of. In verse 5, last part of verse 5, he says, we have sinned and committed iniquity. This is his prayer to God. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. He says, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. He's just kind of recounting his own history. He's saying, we didn't obey the scriptures. We didn't listen to the prophets that you sent. In verse 7, he says, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. So in other words, Daniel is just reflecting the fact that we've been disobedient to you, God. We've not listened to your word nor your prophets. Uh, we have invited this misery on ourselves because we've been walking in deliberate disobedience. You are righteous. You are faithful. You are merciful. But shame on us. And he just, and, he, and, and again, he's just gripped by his own sin and the sin of his people. And basically, chapter 9 here of Daniel, verses 1 through 19, it's all about repentance from sin. He just goes on and on. You can read through the rest of the section. He just goes on and on about his grief over his own sin and the sin of his people, and he repents. Now, repent is a word in the Bible. It's not common in everyday conversation, but it is all throughout the Bible. Repent just simply means this, to turn from sin and turn toward God. That you make a 180 degree change, you leave your life of sin, the, the practices, the habits, the behavior, and you turn towards God and you get right with Him. That's what repent is all about. And it's all through the Bible. The Bible is basically a book about repentance. 
It is about turning from sin, turning toward God, and having relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible's all about. It's God's love letter to mankind to help us understand He's righteous, we are not. He's holy, we are not. He's perfect, we are not. Well, how do you get to a righteous, holy, and perfect God? Certainly not by our own good works, because none of us are good enough and can do enough good to get to that level of where God is. And so God bridged the gap between His perfect holiness and our imperfect unrighteousness, unholiness, bridge that gap with the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, who dies on a cross for our sins. And that the Bible then says, if we put our faith in what Christ did, we can have our sins forgiven. We can be made right with God. And that gap that separates us because of our sin is now closed. And we can have relationship and fellowship with the creator of the universe because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on a cross. And by faith, we accept what Jesus did and our sins are forgiven and we're saved. How many are, are thankful for your salvation? Amen. So, so it begins with repentance. It, the, a relationship with Jesus begins with repentance. And repent, again, is found throughout the Bible. It was the first word recorded in Scripture, uttered off the lips of John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 2. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And interestingly, the very first recorded words off the lips of Jesus, also the word repent, in Matthew 4, verse 17, where he said the same thing, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so with Daniel here in this story, the question becomes, what precipitated all this repentance? What caused Daniel to be so sorry about his sin and the sin of his people? And here's the answer. What caused him to come to this place of contrition and confession was because he opened the book of Jeremiah and he read the scriptures. And when he read the book of Jeremiah and, and the part that I already quoted with you from chapter 29, he read about how merciful God is, how kind God is, how faithful and patient and forgiving God is. And so it moved him to a place of humility and honesty with God. And he felt sorry for his sin. You see, the Bible also teaches us, it's in Romans 2 verse 4, that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. When we have an encounter with the goodness of God, when we get a glimpse of the patience of God and the forgiveness of God, when we see God as a merciful, loving Father, as He truly is, it motivates us to draw near to Him. And that's what happened here with Daniel. Let me illustrate it on a human level. When you've done something really terrible that you're ashamed of, you know it, but someone else doesn't, are you more apt to come clean and be honest with someone who is typically angry and unforgiving or with someone who is typically loving and merciful? You see, the latter describes God. God is loving and He is Merciful, And it's the reason why Daniel found it so easy to open up and repent. And it's the reason why we should find it so easy to open up and repent with God. Because he is merciful, forgiving, and loving. He is not angry and unforgiving. Unfortunately, a lot of people have this misperception of God. He's just always angry. He's always irritable. He always wish, wants, you know, wants to hurt you. you know, and, he's, and, he, and he's just quick to punish. That is not an act. Listen, God is certainly just, and there comes a day of punishment, and, and He will balance every inequity, and He will settle every score. But our Father in heaven is long-suffering with us. He is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance, the Bible says. He is faithful to us and loving toward us and merciful toward us. In fact, in Jeremiah 29, what we read just a moment ago, it highlights the fact that God says, I intend good for you. He says, I have thoughts about you that are thoughts of peace. I have intentions of you for a hope and a future. He says, and when you pray to me, I'm going to listen. And when you draw near to me, you're going to find me. No wonder Daniel turned to God the way he did, because mercy motivates, anger intimidates. You got to understand the difference in your perception of God. If you see him as an angry God, then he intimidates and you don't want to draw near to him. 
If you see him as you should see him, as a merciful God, mercy motivates. See, when I know my Father is merciful now, when I sin against him, when I disobey him, I want to run to him. I'm quick to run because I know he's a merciful God who's forgiving towards me. This is important for us to understand. Because without a proper view of God, then when we sin, we're reluctant to draw near to him. Because we think God is just angry and unforgiving. We don't turn to the one who loves us and can forgive us because we think God always walks around like he's in a bad mood. Like, you know, have you ever, is your perception of God like, you know, he must not have gotten his morning cup of coffee. You know, God just always seems to be cranky. And I, I just don't want to even approach him because he's just angry and he's just mean and he's unforgiving. That's not true at all. In reality, God is merciful. He is loving. He is patient. He is faithful to us. In fact, in the last few minutes I have left, I just want to highlight something else that Jeremiah the prophet. Now, Daniel's reading from the book of Jeremiah, but Jeremiah also wrote the book of Lamentations. And Jeremiah had a wonderful view of who God is. It's important that we grasp the same understanding that Jeremiah had about who God is. Because Jeremiah would also write this in the book of Lamentations. It's chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. He says, because of, I like it in the NIV. He says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, if you want to write in the margin of your Bible these three words, you can, or you can even turn there to Lamentations 3. But I want to highlight with you three characteristics of God that are important. Love compassion, and faithfulness. This is what Jeremiah writes here in Lamentations 3. And we would do well to hold on to these things lest any shame or guilt drives a distance between us and God. The distance that is created between us and God is our doing, not His. He closed the gap through the sacrifice of His Son. So any distance is on our end. Because God is loving, compassionate, and faithful. And I just want to quickly cycle through those three things. Number one, highlighting the word love. God is loving. Some of your Bibles might say merciful. It's the Hebrew word chesed. It means mercy and kindness. This is who God is. He's a loving, merciful God. Psalm 103, 10 and 11 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Are you thankful for that? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jeremiah 31, 3, God speaking through Jeremiah says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Number two, God is compassionate. That's the other thing that Jeremiah says here in this text. God is compassionate. In Psalm 145, 8 to 9, it says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. And do you know that it was God's compassion that David drew upon when he was convicted about his affair with Bathsheba? After Nathan the prophet called David out, David was quick to repent. And when he repented, he named the compassion of God as something that he was leaning on because he understood the weight of his sin and all he could do was appeal to the mercy of God. And so in Psalm 51, 1 and 2, Daniel would say, have, uh, rather David would say, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And lastly, Jeremiah highlights here in Lamentations 3, the fact that God is faithful. In Psalm 145, 13, it says, The Lord is faithful to all His promises and loving toward all He has made. And in Psalm 36, 5, it says, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. In other words, the faithfulness of God is boundless. These are the things of God. And this is how He is toward us. And this is the reason why Daniel so could easily repent of his sins and draw near to God because he was motivated by the mercies of God. He's reading through the scroll of Jeremiah and he realizes, hey, the 70 years are about up. Look how faithful God is. He's never forgotten about us. He's merciful and forgiving and he's going to bring the Jewish people back. And oh, how true that is about the character of God toward us. 
He is long-suffering and patient with us. He is loving and compassionate. He is faithful toward us. So then, what is the reason why we wouldn't want to repent? Why would we not want to draw near to God when we understand who He really is? And what I love about what Jeremiah writes here in Lamentations chapter 3 is the part about they are new every morning. What are new? His love, His compassion, His faithfulness. Every single morning when you get up, there's a new dose of God's love, mercy, compassion, and faithfulness for you. Every single morning of your life when you get up, it's an opportunity for a new day and a clean start because that's the way God is. He's a God of multiple chances. You say, well, Pastor Gary, if you only knew what I've done, if you only knew my past, then I don't know that you'd say that. Listen, I don't need to know what you've done or know your past. Jesus died for it, and his mercies are new for you every single morning of your life. Every single morning. So the only reason that we won't receive it is because we won't repent. Repent. Draw near to God. Turn from sin and draw near to you. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 55, 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That's our God. And what he wants from us is to just be broken over our sin and to repent, to turn from sin and turn towards him. He stands with open arms as a loving, good father ready to forgive, ready to receive, ready to save. So let's pray together as we close our service now. Lord, we thank you that Daniel was so moved in his heart with repentance because he got a glimpse of your mercy and your grace, how loving you are, how faithful you are. And I pray today for anybody who feels that they're distant from you, that they would repent and turn near to you that they would turn to you, Lord, and turn away from sin. Your word tells us in Acts chapter 3, repent and turn to Jesus, that our sins might be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Acts 3.19. How good it is, Lord, to know that you are compassionate and forgiving, that you are merciful, that you died on a cross for every sinful, shameful thing we've ever done, ever said, ever thought. I'm going to pause in my prayer right now with your head still bowed, and I'm just going to invite you, if you want to just really draw near to the Lord today, then I just want to invite you to repent. I know it's a big biblical word, but it just simply means to turn from sin and turn towards God. To renounce your ways and to accept Christ. And so with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm just going to lead you in a simple prayer. And if you want to just repent and draw near to the Lord and receive Christ as your Savior, I just invite you to open up your heart and accept Him by faith. And you can pray a simple prayer like this. This is the beginning of a journey with Him. Just pray a simple prayer. Open up your heart. Pray a simple prayer. I'll lead you. You can just go slowly. Repeat it after me. Just whisper it to the Lord. He knows, he knows your heart. And you can just simply say this with me. You can just simply say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me so much that you died on a cross for my sins. You paid a price for me. You took the guilt and the punishment intended for me. And you forgave me. I receive your forgiveness right now. I receive your love for me. Thank you for being a merciful, good Savior. I open my heart to you, and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life and take over my life as Lord. I surrender to you right now. I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and I turn towards you. Thank you for loving me and dying for me. I trust you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.